The National Crop Insurance Services Agriculture and Technology Research Program has existed for 94 years. The first projects were conducted by the Western Hail and Adjustment Association and the roots of the program can be traced back to its first research projects in 1923. These first projects were initiated on cotton at Clemson University in 1923 and the following year at Alabama Polytechnic Institute, which later changed its name to Auburn University in 1960. These projects focused not on crop damage, but rather on agronomics that were designed to determine row spacing, planting populations, and planting dates. By the end of the 1920s, the first projects that focused on hail damage were initiated on corn. The projects began at Iowa State University and were expanded the following year to the University of Nebraska. Research at both locations focused on elucidating the effects of defoliation, leaf shredding, and direct damage to stalks and ears. Further projects were initiated at Iowa State University in 1930 on the cereal crops barley, oats, and wheat. These projects were focused on determining the impact of plant cutoffs and direct damage to stem and grain heads. However, more pressing and ominous issues in the agricultural world took center stage in the 1930s and the research program did not initiate any new projects for six years. In 1938, research was initiated at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, and this marked the beginning of a research collaboration between the crop hail industry and the Canadians, a relationship that still exists today. This project expanded the prior wheat research on direct damage to heads and stems at the Iowa State University. The 1940s witnessed an expansion of crop hail research. Projects were initiated in 1943 at Texas A&M University, Iowa State University, and the University of Illinois. Following the end of World War II, projects were initiated on wheat in 1946 and flax in 1947. These projects were followed in 1948 with the first sugar beet research. By the end of the decade, further research on wheat and corn had begun. Projects during this era marked the beginning of stand reduction research and further expanded on research on defoliation, cutoffs, and direct damage. 1950 ushered in a decade of great change in American agriculture. The expansion of crop hail research coincided with the advent of chemical nitrogen fertilization and further adoption of mechanization. Research continued on corn, soybean, and sugar beet, and wheat research was expanded. Barley and oat research was also reinitiated. However, the 1950s may be best known for widespread research on cotton, dry bean, potatoes, grain sorghum, and the initiation of research on vegetable crops. The 50s also brought the first research on tobacco. The 1960s witnessed continued research on the major crops from previous years. Corn research expanded into Illinois and research initiated on sunflower and grapes. However, the 1960s will be best known for expanding the research initiated in 1956 on tobacco. Research continued on crops from previous years in the 70s and 80s. Notable during this period was the expansion of potato research to Colorado, grapes to California, and tomato to Florida. Nonetheless, research expanded to many new crops during this area, including popcorn, chili peppers, rice, pea, corn silage and safflower, apples, and more fruit and vegetable crops. From 1990 to 2010, NCIS further expanded the research portfolio to more new crops and more growing regions. For the first time, rice was evaluated in Arkansas, chili pepper research expanded to Colorado, and potato research expanded to Oregon and Michigan. Research on the new BT and high oil corn began, and cord silage research was expanded as well. Research began on lentil and millet and modern pea cultivars. And for the first time, wild rice, watermelon, alfalfa seed, and cranberries were researched. More recently, there was grower interest in new hybrid rice cultivars that shatter more readily than conventional varieties, so research was initiated. Canola research expanded greatly, and wheat research was reinitiated after a long hiatus. Late R stage soybean defoliation research is currently being evaluated and comparisons between determinate and indeterminate varieties are included. 
Lentils are still on the radar, and potato research comparing medium and late maturity varieties was recently completed. Continuing research on AUP cotton is underway, and millet stand reduction research has begun. Wheat hanger research to update the existing charts has been initiated and will continue at more locations, and a new crop, food grade natto soybeans, is being evaluated. Going forward, NCIS is expanding research this year on wheat hangers to include locations in Zone 2 and Zone 5. Popcorn stand reduction research will be evaluated for the first time in 32 years and include stand reduction on sweet corn as well. Both projects will determine if these corn types respond to stand reduction in the same manner as field corn. Grain sorghum stand reduction research will be initiated for the first time in 38 years, and potato research evaluating second and third losses will be conducted for the first time. These research efforts have resulted in 46 crop hail loss instructions, as well as numerous additions and modifications to multi peril crop insurance loss adjustment handbooks. Further, prior to crop hail research, there was little mention and poor definitions of the developmental stages of many crop plants. However, due to the importance of growth stage definitions and loss adjustment procedures, research initiated through the program has led to the development of growth stage definitions of many crop plants. Thus, the crop hail industry can be credited with a lasting legacy in plant science research that remains pertinent to many crop disciplines today. After all of this research, what else is there left that has not been covered in the previous 94 years? Well, the answer to this question is plenty. When the first corn projects were conducted in 1928, open pollinated corn was still the primary source of genetics. Since then, breeding and genetic technologies have advanced rapidly and continually fill the pipeline with new varieties and hybrids that are higher yielding and more vigorous and have new traits that confer numerous benefits that their predecessors did not have. Over time, do these advances also affect how plants respond to damage? We really do not know until we conduct research. For BT or high oil corn, we found that these traits do not appreciably affect how the corn plant responds to damage. But for semi-dwarf wheat, research is suggesting that the modern varieties do respond differently than older varieties. Further, the authors of recently published research suggest that soybean breeders should focus on reducing the number of leaves on soybean plants. If followed, how may this affect soybean response to defoliation and other damage? Change is always taking place, and given the parabolic nature of scientific research, who knows what the future holds 10 years from now with respect to crop plants and the response to damage. Not all yield increases are the result of breeding and genetics, though. In fact, experts think that nearly one-third of the yield increase from soybeans since the 1970s is the result of new production practices that are constantly developed. As knowledge of cropping systems develop, so do new ideas on how to produce the nation's feed and fiber. Extension personnel and producers themselves are always trying new things. One example is planting dates. Seed companies and extension have been promoting earlier planting dates for years. But earlier planting dates often coincide with cooler, wetter weather that can result in significant stand loss and necessitate replanting of failed stands. In light of this, the NCIS research program reevaluated replant dates and found that recent extension research indicates that soybean yields compensate better than expected when planted late. This results in significantly lower losses at the latest planting dates, the green area with the numbers showing the corresponding reduction in losses, and slightly higher losses at mid-replant dates, the red area with positive numbers showing increased losses. Producers tend to also be good marketers, and every marketer likes a new product. While soybean has been grown on a large scale in the U.S. for nearly 80 years, food grade soybeans are just beginning to catch on and demand outstrips supply. As a result, producers receive a premium for their bushels, so planted acreage is growing. They are smaller than traditional soybean and higher in protein than most conventional varieties. Researchers and industry personnel know they grow differently, so it is understood that they may respond to plant damage differently than other soybean. For these reasons, NCIS is researching natto soybean to see if indeed they do respond differently to nature's perils. Although rape is not a new crop, canola has only been grown for about 40 years. In the last 10 years, acreage has spiked with new varieties entering the marketplace. Chickpeas and lentils are another example. 
The adoption of these relative newcomers has coincided with interest in growing food grade products on large scale in the U.S. and acreage is increasing. NCIS has recognized that these trends are becoming important to U.S. producers and have initiated research to determine how these crops respond to plant damage. Although genetics and new practices have produced increased yields, these factors alone do not account for the increases in production seen in crops in the United States. In fact, most increases in production result from the expansion of acreage into new growing regions. As an example, this graph shows the dramatic expansion of soybean production that coincided with the expansion of soybean acreage up to about 1980. But in North Dakota, relatively few acres were in soybean in 1980. Since then, acreage has ballooned as breeders have selected for very early maturing soybean that are adapted to this northerly environment. Because of the short season, NCIS and researchers in North Dakota have conducted research there and at other locations to see if these northern soybean respond differently to plant damage than those grown in other regions. For the most part, these short season soybean respond to plant damage similarly to soybean in more traditional soybean growing regions. Canola expansion into the southern Great Plains is another example. In Oklahoma, there was no measurable canola production 10 years ago, but currently several hundred thousand acres are planted. Here and in Kansas, canola is grown as a winter crop, often in place of wheat to break disease and insect cycles. Because the expansion into these areas also coincided with new management practices of growing canola as a winter crop, Growers and researchers think that the crops grow differently than in the traditional northern growing regions. Because of this, NCIS has been conducting research in these areas to determine if canola does indeed respond differently to plant damage in these new growing regions. Independent research is vital to NCIS's ability to obtain objective results that most accurately capture the effects of crop damage and allow for the development of proper loss adjustment procedures. The vast majority of research approved by the committees is contracted to land-grant university researchers. These researchers are ex experts in the physiology and production of specific agronomic crops. It is through this network of researchers that the NCIS Agriculture and Technology Research Program acquires the data for loss adjustment procedures. Perhaps the most importantly, this network of researchers are state employees and are most often extension personnel with a mission to provide information to producers. Having these researchers conduct the experiment means that the research is unbiased and transparent. This allows the crop insurance industry to maintain an arm's length from the research that drives the adjustment of losses and helps eliminate the perception that an adjustment procedure is stacked against insurance. In turn, this research model further fosters the notion that the crop insurance industry is truly acting in good faith when adjusting losses. We thank the NCIS Board of Directors and our member companies for their support. We also thank the USDA Risk Management Agency and our network of land-grant university researchers.